In this episode of the Bible Project podcast, Tim and I are going to be dialoguing about a theme in the Bible that begins at the very beginning of Scripture, goes all the way to the end, and it's a theme that's central to Jesus' message, but it's incredibly difficult for us to understand. Well, I should say, at least for me to understand, it's the theme of the kingdom of God. This dialogue was super helpful for me in wrapping my mind around why that was so central to Jesus' message and what it should mean to me if I'm trying to follow Jesus. We broke this up into three parts in this first part. Tim introduces the concept of the kingdom of God and shows us how it is staring us in the face in Genesis chapter 1. One of the most interesting little mental exercises to do is to ask yourself, if I tried to boil down everything I know about what Jesus ever said, if I had to summarize it in one sentence or think of one saying or teaching that that is the essence of what I think he taught, what would that be? Right, so what would it be? Well, you tell me. It's my, my question. Um, I've done it before. So yeah, yeah. yeah we, just, we just did this. this is, we already went through this <laughs> exercise. <laughs> but I said, love your neighbor is what I said. Yes. Love your neighbor, popular number one. Yeah. Coming in at a hot second is would be like the golden rule. Do right, unto right. others as you would have them do to you. Yep. Um, maybe, you know, s- somebody who's really passionate about social justice might think of love your enemies, mm-hmm. forgive them, pray for them, that kind of thing. Someone who deals with a lot of anxiety like me, I always go to do not worry. For some reason, that one feels like an important... Yeah, birds don't yeah, worry birds about don't worry. their foods, yeah. of, so why should you? Yeah. Um, so, so here's what's interesting about that, is that how I summarize what I think is the main message or teaching of Jesus tells me a lot about who I think Jesus was. Okay. And... So, in contrast to that is an interesting fact that three of the four accounts of Jesus' life in the New Testament, uh, the Gospels according to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they summarize the whole message of Jesus for us in the first sentence that they put in his mouth um, when he comes onto the public scene in each of those Gospels. And that summary sentence is, Repent, for the kingdom of God is here or it has arrived. So from the gospel author's point of view, the moral teachings of Jesus, love your neighbor, the scandalous moral teachings, forgive your enemies, that kind of thing, those are not the essence of Jesus' message. Those are subordinate to some larger, more important idea. Those behaviors only make sense in light of some bigger thing. And that bigger thing is that the kingdom of God is here. And and so would you say because the gospel authors summarize it as the kingdom of God is here or near, or wh- what do they say? Here mm-hmm. or near? Uh, near or near. has arrived. Or has arrived. What, kind of the way I like to paraphrase it. That since they're doing that, that's how a Christ follower should, should yeah, do as Yeah, I well. think, yeah. So we tend to, by those summaries, think of Jesus primarily as a moral teacher. The gospels are interested in portraying Jesus as a prophet Hmm. in line with Israel's prophets who was announcing and heralding the great day of God's justice and salvation. Do you think that we don't emphasize that because we just don't understand? I mean, it's a lot harder to understand this idea Mm -hmm. of the kingdom of God, how that ties into all this prophecy. I mean, it's really Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. dense. Yeah, it's all, it's a foreign narrative to us. Yeah. You know, so we we in the West have an uh, a grand narrative of like moral progress. Mm-hmm. Really. I mean, that's the driving narrative of the Western world Good is point. of yeah. moral yep. progress. So, we like to tie Jesus into that where we can. Hmm. But Jesus's grand narrative was about the covenant story of God and Israel and the world yeah. coming to its climax in himself and the arrival of the kingdom. And that's weird. That's b- and because kingdom and prophecy has in American Christianity mostly been dominated by 
end of the world, left behind right. weirdness that we th- we don't know what to do with this part of who Jesus is. Yeah, that makes sense. And that's why I like this project so much is, is it's going back and saying, okay, what is this mm. kind of crazy story? Mm-hmm. That's, well, it's unfamiliar to us. We get feedback that the word crazy is not, <laughs> <laughs> it's a bad word to use. Yeah. We like to use it. It's an unfamiliar, yeah. surprising, strange story. Yeah. And so this idea of God's kingdom, that's a, that's one of the strangest things for Yeah, for we don't, you know, other than, I mean, there are still kingdoms in the world today, but they're mostly like, kind of, you know, the United Kingdom, Britain, has oh, okay. a queen, you know, oh, okay. and a prince and princess and that kind of thing. But... For the most part, they're archaic okay. survivals from an earlier era of yeah. human history. So, so kingdom and kings isn't a social reality for you know right. m- most Westerners and for most of the modern world. So we think of democracy, yeah. not kings. Sure. And so it's just, so the word is f- foreign in its imagery. And then the story, the biblical story that Jesus sees himself fulfilling is also foreign to us because it's not our grand narrative. But so the whole point is that for Jesus, he summarized his message. The kingdom of God is what Jesus talked about more than any other topic, hands down. So just in the Gospel of Matthew alone, Jesus mentions the kingdom over 50 times, which Mm is 1.5 times per page (laughs) of the 28th chapter of Gospel of Matthew. So it's clearly that's what he dominated. Uh, that was the dominating theme of his teaching. So if we want to understand who Jesus is and who he sees himself as, we need to learn what this term meant and how it fits into the story of the Bible. kingdom, if you look like in a dictionary, it primarily refers to a place. And the Greek and Hebrew words, Greek basileia and and Hebrew uh, malkut, uh, refers to an activity, an action. Or in English, it refers to a place. In, in English, it Hebrew refers to a place. The biblical term, Greek. Old Testament and New Testament, refers primarily to to an action that includes a place. So here's how I say it in the notes here, that in in Bible, it refers to an action, the rule or the reign of a king over his people, which is going to be somewhere. So like you're kingdoming someone? Yeah, or I actually think the the verbs rule or or we have uh, the noun in English, the, the reign of a king. Right. Um, which in, obviously it has to take place somewhere. So by saying the reign of a king is is the same thing as saying the kingdom of a king. In the Bible, yes. In the Bible. Yep. Or uh, the word kingdom has just stuck with us from older English from the King James. Right. And uh, Tyndale before him. And that noun has just stuck in the English translations over time. But the, the biblical word refers to the activity of a king reigning over his people. Oh. So... Um, so, when, so when Jesus says the kingdom of God is here, you could translate that the reign of God is here. Correct. And the importance is that, especially because Matthew is the first gospel in the New Testament, the frequent phrase in Matthew is the kingdom of heaven, which Jesus uses synonymously with the kingdom of God. Heaven mm-hmm. is just a, a paraphrase. Because it's we're talking about God's reign or the reign of heaven. So, but the the problem in the history of Western interpretation has been because kingdom of heaven is what people read first in the New Testament. Right. They think of it as a place. Um, yeah, because heaven is a place. Heaven is God's space yeah. up in the clouds somewhere. And, and so, so there's a kingdom up there. There's a kingdom up there and it's arriving here. And that's, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, a, a, that's not too far from the idea, but, the, but it's, it, it's more talking about there is a place, there's God's space where God is king and where everything... There's a reality in which God reigns. There's a reality in which God reigns and where everything that is done is God's will. Uh-huh. And the story of the Bible as it goes on 
uh, the earth has become a place where God's will is not done because Mm -hmm. we assert our will over it and God's allowed us to do that. And so Jesus is announcing the arrival of God's reign to take back his world from us. (laughs) That's at least phase one. It's not quite as simple as that, but phase one meaning, well, sorry, no, we're getting idea one, idea one. Yeah. So there you go. Kingdom in the Bible refers to an activity primarily. It assumes a place, right? So if, if a king is reigning, he's reigning over some people somewhere. So that's kind of, that idea is taken for granted in yes. Hebrew thought. Yeah. Whereas in English, it refers, we think of a place. Yeah. As opposed to the, the, du- cu- the person and the, and the way that the person the is The word kingdom, I mean, what is, is that Latin dumb? What's dumb mm. even mean? Mm. Dumb, the Latin root dumb. Did you find it? Well, on Wiktionary, it forms a noun that denotes the condition, power, dominion, authority, or state. From Proto Germanic domas. Domas. Ah, so forming nouns that denote a condition or state. Boredom, freedom, oh, right, martyrdom, sure. stardom. Okay, so it's, a state of the king so is a kingdom. F- forming nouns that note the dom- domain or jurisdiction. Christendom, fiefdom, kingdom. So those are the two main ones a condition or a domain. Uh, and domain kind of speaks to land. Yeah, or yeah, exactly. Yeah, geog- geography. Whereas um, it can also form words, a condition. But that's what you're speaking to is the that's, condition. Yeah, in Bible, it's referring to a condition or uh, a state of activity. So boredom, <laughs> boredom is a state of being bored. Kingdom is a state of being ruled, a state of being under someone's rule. Yeah. Um, if you're under, the, if you're in the kingdom, if you are bringing the kingdom, you are r- reigning. You're bringing the rule. You're bringing the rule. Yes. So some of my fav, you know, uh, favorite New Testament scholars on this whole topic, um, R. T. France or N. T. Wright or um, a German guy, um, uh, Yeremias, they translate it with as a the rule of God or the reign of God has mm-hmm. arrived. Cool. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a helpful. It just twists it in English a little bit to, to get give the to right make it fresh. And on then, all, then it gets you asked a question, what does it mean for a Jewish prophet to come onto the scene two thousand years ago saying the rule of God has arrived? Right. Has God not been ruling? Well and it help it's yeah. helpful because it's a word we still use. It's a word we still use. To rule. I don't go around yeah. really talking about kingdoms. Yeah. And even rule or reign. It's not a, like you wouldn't, like a manager <laughs> doesn't reign in the office. Who, who's, in char- <laughs> who's in charge? Who's in charge here? We would say who's in charge. Who's the boss? Yep. 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 So uh, N.T. Wright's paraphrase is um, uh, running the show. <laughs> uh, or, yeah, in charge. Okay. Yeah. So, with, which just begged a bunch of questions. So what does it mean for the reign of God to arrive in Jesus? Right. Um, And how would a Jewish person perceive that? That's right. And so there I think uh, we have to go back to just the biblical story. Um, And the kingdom of God is one of these themes that runs from page one to the very last page. Literally from page one to the second to last paragraph of the Bible. Nice. Nice. So, it, it gives so this us is a truly nice, a theme that runs nice clean straight run. through yeah. the Bible. Yeah. A good Bible trivia fact great at parties to know um, what's the first time where is the first time that the word rule or reign or anything to do with a king Uh or reigning appears in the Bible yeah I guess I've already given it away you have but if I hadn't looked at your notes I probably would have guessed um, I'm looking at your notes though now and so I'm I'm (laughs) It's ruined. I'm it's sorry. ruined. I'm sorry. All right. There's one more. There's one more Bible trivia fact that okay. I, I won't reveal to you yet. 
So, yeah, where in the Bible is the first time the idea of ruling or reigning appears? Um, page page one, or in some Bibles, the way the page might be formatted, page two. Um, and it's uh, closely connected to the image of God. So The idea of reigning is. The idea of reigning, yeah. So God makes a really good world full of potential. Um, it's exploding with potential and life. Um, and uh, near the culmination of Genesis 1 is the famous line, um, God created mankind in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them, said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, every other living creature that moves on the ground. So... Uh, that word rule, it's th one of the standard Hebrew words for what kings do, uh, to, to rule or to reign. It, it's not the word kingdom. It's not the word kingdom, no. But it's, um, so in studying biblical themes, uh, you need to be sensitive to not just assuming. Not do word studies. Yeah, yeah, theme studies are distinct from word studies. Yeah, so an idea can be represented by lots of different words right. or even metaphors. So the idea can be present even if the But if the not. word kingdom kind of means the verb rule, That's there's right. another word yeah. that also means rule. Yes, yeah, there's multiple, there's probably about three different verbs that describe the act of ruling or reigning as a king. And they all have different nuances. Okay. <clears throat> but this one has to do with... Um, uh, r ruling, having having an authority to oversee and to s steward and manage. Hmm. Does it have um, kind of kingly connotations? Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, that's why the word rule, it's a great translation because you to say rule, you're yeah. like, well, wh who uses that word? Right. Like, a, that's not what your boss does at Subway. He doesn't right. rule <laughs> the place or... So that's he a verb, and does. even in English, that we think of someone in a gut state of governing authority. That's what we use the word rule for. And that's similar here. So it's depicting humans as having some royal task. Hmm. And that connects back to the image of God. So here's the big question. Do we do a quick movement on the image of God in this video? Hmm. So have, have we, done, we did that before. We did that quickly Genesis in Genesis one. 1, but this would be to bring out a different nuance of it. Um, so that's Genesis 1. I'm not just, just did we ever talk about just image. doing a video on image of God? Yeah, you know, I thought so. And then I looked in our theme videos. Well, I know it's not on the list, it's but I think we had discussed it before. Yeah, we had. I think um, to be, I, it actually will be wrapped up in the new humanity. Oh, uh, right. I think that we're doing something on new humanity. Right. Isn't that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, that, that'll that be that one. So when you say it's a royal task, I mean, I don't even really understand royalty and kingdoms that well, but yeah. it, it seems yeah. like that had a certain very special meaning, royal. Yes. Yes, it does. Yes. So let's look at Psalm 8, and then let's think about the image of God, and then this all comes together okay. in a really... I think, profound way. So Psalm 8 is a poetic reflection on Genesis 1 and specifically humanity's role in the world. Um, so Psalm 8 verse 4 begins with this line, what is mankind that you are mindful um, yeah. of him? What's humanity that you care for him? You've made him a little lower than the angels. Which is pretty awesome. Right, so... So that's reflecting on this, that human beings are made out of dirt, so we're earthlings, yeah. literally, but there's also something transcendent or sacred, right? Right. So um, the biologists call this, what, emerging, an emergent form, something? This is physics. An emergent form. Oh. Where in it evolutionary development, there are these leaps that happen where the complexity of a f form isn't reducible to any one mm -hmm. cause, but to multiple factors, mm -hmm. and it's a new entity. It's not just a lot of people think of consciousness that way. That's right, exactly right. Right. So, and it doesn't mean we can't trace the development, 
but it does mean at some point it stops being a whole bunch of the things from the previous stage and it is a new genuine thing in its own right. So wh what am I talking about? <laughs> yeah, um, that, uh, that bec oh, the we were humans. dust, but That's right. there's something else there. There's something other other than dust about humans yeah so in genesis 1 that's reflected as this image of god in genesis right. 2 it's called the divine breath that animates the humans right but it's this the humans are a, a mix of heaven and earth okay the bible would be the bible's way of talking about it so, and so they're crowned and notice immediately it goes they're crowned with glory and honor you made them rulers over the works of your hands and everything so crowned image i mean yes King, crowns a king. <laughs> and rulers so here's the and under your feet that's a very royal under your feet yeah that's right yeah it's of a being on a throne with ha having like a footstool or yeah. an image of again of authority right so he here's the, uh, within the the narrative world of genesis 1 god is the creator king he speaks things happen he makes a people who are going to live under his reign mm -hmm. he makes these people in a w certain way and gives them a unique role. They are the image of God. And traditionally in Western history, image of God has been, you know, studied as some trait that makes humans unique from right. animals. Like our like ethics that. or our... Um, Ability to forgive, relationship or covenant or the in ability. intellect, consciousness, something yeah. like that. Um, so the the by far the consensus in biblical studies like you'll read commentaries is that the meaning of the image of god is anchored one in genesis one in the way in the sentence <laughs> the way the sentence is put together but two in its ancient near eastern context and i don't know if we have time to go into this but it's interesting then god said let us make humanity in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion mm -hmm. over the fish of the sea. Um, so in Hebrew, there's no periods. <laughs> so let's take out that period. Let us make humans in our image after our likeness and let them rule or let them have dominion. So in the first time the image of God is used, it's directly connected to something. To reigning. To reigning. So humans are the way that God reigns the world. Mm -hmm. So it's a very interesting narrative beginning. The image of God is something that humans are and something humans do. Mm. They, they embody and image God's rule and reign over the world. Mm. And so that's how the narrative of the Bible sets up, is that God's plan was to share his world with humans and to have his reign and his rule and his will be brought about in the world through human beings so which really open if you if you start thinking through the stories of the bible there are very few stories where god acts or does anything that doesn't happen through a human hmm. so even think of the exodus like the parting of the red right. sea but yeah. if you're just an israelite looking on you would see moses you know with his staff yeah. over the waters so the whole, the, the way the God of the Bible works is through image-bearing human beings. And that's how God, God reigns the world through humans. <laughs> and humans, so this is the ancient Near Eastern context, is that um, the words image, the word image r refers to statue. Right. Um, and it is used to refer to idol statues yeah. in Israel's history. So Israel was not supposed to ever make images to represent God. But they were one. But the Bible begins with God making an image of God's own self in humans. Right. Um, all, m most of the large-scale, like, large statues that have survived from the ancient world mm -hmm. are images of gods or kings. And specifically, Egyptian and Assyrian and Babylonian kings were considered, viewed themselves in their cultures as deities. Mm -hmm. um, and so in Egyptian, the phrase image of God is used, but only ever to describe the king as the image of God. Hmm. Um, and it's the hmm. same in ancient Assyrian and Babylonian. Wow, so there's this very kind of flattening democratic kind of thing yeah. happening at the yes. beginning of Genesis. Yeah, so this is what's cool. It's, so Genesis 1, I think, is intentionally making 
a charged statement in hmm. its day that not just kings. being the image of God is not something that only the elite do, hmm. but rather it's it's a reality that all human beings are. Yeah. And you see that in the narrative. All humanity as a whole is given this task to rule and to reign. It's all humanity. Hmm. Um, which is why in Genesis nine, image of God is connected to the sacredness of all human life then. So if someone murders another human, if you shed blood, by your blood shall be shed because humans are made in the image of God. So the point is that all humans are these. There isn't classes. There, there isn't, isn't classes, like yeah, within the narrative world of the Bible. There's just humans who image God. And humans have this royal yeah. task. And I guess that's not <clears throat> very scandalous for... Mm. Like uh, for West modern Westerners, modern Westerner. No, what's scandalous is that this is a this is a, a biblical idea. Like that's where the idea comes from. Right. It was not, and it's not something we have received from. It wasn't a Greek idea. Not a Greek idea. Certainly wasn't um, uh, an, an Eastern, Eastern idea. idea. Yeah. It's a Jewish Christian idea. Yeah. That humans are sacred because they are made. And in this moment, it was a very revolutionary idea. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I think wrapping all this together, I think um, Genesis 1, the first time the idea of reigning or ruling or of God reigning or ruling in the Bible, no, of anybody. <laughs> Actually, God reigning, that's the other trivia question. So <laughs> um, the first time the word or the concept of ruling or reigning appears. It's humans uh -huh. ruling or reigning over creation, and it's tied to their um, nature as made in God's image. Huh. So God's the king. He reigns, but the Bible begins with God sharing that rule and asking humans to embody that rule and reign over creation. So it's tied to the human project of humans managing and ruling the world on God's behalf. The video for the Kingdom of God will be up on YouTube before the end of the year, uh, December 2015. That's what we're shooting for. Uh, the rest of this conversation will be in the next two episodes. In the next episode, we talk about uh, what went wrong with the Kingdom of God and then God's plan to fix it. You can follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash join the Bible project. We're also on Twitter at join Bible proj and all of our videos, which we're really proud of short animated films that trace a theme all the way through scripture and also short films that, that walk through the literary structure of books of the Bible. Those are all on our YouTube channel for free at youtube.com slash the Bible project. If you like this podcast, you can help us by sharing it and putting a review on iTunes or whatever podcasting service you use. That'd be, that'd be great. We'd like that. Thanks for being a part of this with us.